you can find just you can find the stat for just about anything on the internet. So we were wondering, could someone find out the average number of sins someone commits in a lifetime? The results? There aren't any. The world just doesn't seem to be able to calculate exactly how many sins we commit each and every single day. Why is that the case? Our first part of scripture of today is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. And it is a letter from Paul to the many churches. And it is a letter of reassurance to the Colossians that one can find spiritual fullness through Christ. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Verse 14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now, what you can find in Google is the rule of thumb when determining what size nail you need. The rule of thumb with nails, two points of get the pun, is that the nail needs to be three times as long as the thickness of the material you are fastening. Three times as long, huh? Can you imagine what Jesus was feeling hanging up there on the cross? Would he need a nail three times larger than the sins we commit every single day to make his love stick? Our second part of scripture from, comes from Luke chapter 26, 30, okay, 32, verses 32 through 34. There you go. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Today, as we prepare to hear a mes the message of forgiveness, know that we don't have to worry about a spiritual pitch count. There isn't a limit to the amount of uh, forgiveness Jesus can deliver as long as we come with a faithful heart. Today, we have an opportunity to take our sins, share them with our Creator, and nail them to a cross that delivers us forgiveness. Our final verse is of the Last Supper that Jesus shared with his disciples. There, when he was beginning to bless the food, he gave the symbolization that we repeat today. This, you can take this from Matthew chapter 36, verses 26, chapter 26, verses 26 to 28. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Verses 27 to 28. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of God for the people of God. And will you bow with me in prayer? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and let all God's people say, Amen. Jesus looks down from the cross and he prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. This scene from the Bible makes it so clear that forgiveness is costly. I mean, we all know that to some extent from our own feeble efforts to forgive, but there's really nothing like this, is there? Jesus calling out for forgiveness as he is dying for people on the cross. It makes it painfully clear that forgiveness is not just God casually forgetting our sins. It is not some divine accounting trick. It is not God saying, oh, I guess sin doesn't matter too much after all. No, forgiveness is heart-wrenching. Forgiveness is, comes at an almost unbearable cost. Jesus looks down from the cross and he prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And since there isn't anybody else even in this scene from the cross, you might at first wonder, well, who's he praying for? Who is Jesus talking about here? But a moment's reflection 
and it becomes clear. Surely Jesus is talking about those leaders who decided to use the, the rules, they used the, the laws to eliminate somebody they disagreed with and were afraid of. Surely Jesus said this about the soldiers who, even though they were just following orders, they put nails through his hands. Surely Jesus was talking about his own disciples and followers who in his hour of need, just left. They, they, they deserted him in that moment. Surely Jesus was talking about all of these people. But we also know who else he was talking about, don't we? He was talking about us. He was talking about you. And he was talking about me. Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. We don't like to think of ourselves that way, do we? I mean, sure, all of us have, have made our share of mistakes, but, you know, there are, there are lowercase sinners, people like us who commit respectable sins, and then there are the uppercase sinners, you know, those people who, who do things we don't do, the real sinners. Surely Jesus was talking about those people from the cross. We like to think that way. It helps us feel better about ourselves. The only problem is we know that's not true. And when we're thinking about Jesus dying on the cross, maybe it's not the best time to be worrying about making ourselves feel better. I mean, surely we too, in our own ways, have tried to exclude, have tried to punish somebody who was different from us or that we disagreed with. Surely we, too, have just followed orders, you know, just gone along with the crowd and done things that make us cringe when we look back on them. Surely we, too, have at some time failed to stand up for Jesus when we had the opportunity to. We know. We know who Jesus was talking about. He was talking about us. He was talking about you. And he was talking about me when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So often, in so many ways, we just don't know what we're doing. It was years ago, but I know it was a Monday because it was supposed to be my day off. But in a weak moment, I'd agreed to to have a meeting that evening on my day off. And since I hadn't prepared for it, I had to go into the office for a while to, to get ready. And you know how it is when you go into the office for a while on your day off. One thing leads to another thing. And, of course, I still had everything else to do on my day off. I still had to run all the errands. I still had to get the house clean. I still had to pick up our daughters from, from piano lessons or from school and get them to their piano lessons so I could rush home and make a quick dinner so I could get to my meeting on time. How was your day off, Pastor? And in the midst of all of that hectic running around, I went through the drive through at Taco Bell to get a bite to eat for my, my lunch silently cursing the driver ahead of me who seemed to order everything on the menu. And I finally got up to, to the window and, and I just sort of grabbed my bag of food and plopped it down on the seat next to me in my van and I, I rode off to Kroger to pick up something quick to make for dinner. And I was just getting to the Kroger when my cell phone rang and it was a dear friend a dear friend from church, and we were, right then, we were working on this big, important project together at church. I was all excited about this project, but she hadn't just called to chat. She'd encountered some setbacks and problems with this project, and she wanted to ask me some questions about what to do next. And for some reason in that conversation, we sort of misunderstood each other. We, we talked past each other, and I found myself speaking harshly to her. I remember saying to this dear friend of mine, I don't think I even want to keep working on this project anymore. And after I, I hung up, I immediately regretted what I had said. 
and I, I pulled into a, an open parking space there at the Kroger, and I opened my bean burrito, <laughs> and I started to eat it. And I thought about all the stuff I'd already done that day and how I had messed almost all of it up. And I thought about all the rest of the stuff I had to do that day and how I was probably going to mess all of it up too. And I started to cry. And, you know, I was vaguely aware of what it might look like to somebody passing by, a grown man by himself in a minivan in the Kroger parking lot eating a bean burrito and crying his eyes out, you know. But I, I just didn't care. At that moment, the, the only thing that occurred to me was to say, Lord Jesus, won't you pray your prayer for me? I don't have any idea what I'm doing down here today. Jesus, won't you pray your prayer for me? And do you know what he said? <laughs> he said, well, sure. Father, won't you forgive that guy, the, the one down there in the van with a bean burrito and tears in his eyes. Forgive that guy because he doesn't have any idea what he's doing. And then all I could think of to say was, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for praying that prayer for me. So part of what it means to be a Christian is to let Jesus pray his prayer for you, to accept and to receive the, the forgiveness that Jesus requests for you and that God so freely grants for you. Remember, we started this series on forgiveness with the truth that the journey to forgiving others begins with the experience of being forgiven. You can't give to other people what you haven't received yourself. And so today we come to the foot of the cross to ask Jesus to pray his prayer for us. Father, forgive her, forgive him. Father, forgive me. They just don't know what they're doing. That's part of what it means to be a Christian. But that's not all it means. To be a Christian also means to, to follow Jesus, right? It means to, to do what Jesus did and to live the sort of life that he lived, which means that we got to pray the prayers that Jesus prayed. We don't just come to the foot of the cross to be forgiven. We also come to become more forgiving, right? We don't just come to let Jesus pray his prayer for us. We come to join Jesus in praying that prayer for other people. Remember last week we learned that in order to forgive somebody, You've got to rediscover your common humanity with them. That whoever they are, whatever they've done, however badly they have hurt you, ultimately that person is just a flawed and broken child of God, the same as you. And we pray, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing any more than I do. And if Jesus can pray that prayer from the cross... Surely we can pray it from wherever we are, too. I had a seminary professor who told us a story one time. He said, I grew up in a little town in Oklahoma. I was a young man during the 1940s, he said. Uh, and he said, the first job that I got as a young man was in a box factory. We put together these wooden crates for, for some kind of uh, operation. Uh, and he said, a couple buddies and I every day would, would take off at noon and we'd walk uptown in this little town to get a hot dog or a hamburger or something to eat for our lunch. And he said, we'd always wear our nail aprons to kind of show off to the girls that we had a real job, you know. We were men. Uh, and, and he said, one day... The, the, uh, on our way to the hamburger stand, we passed a blind man on the sidewalk. He had a guitar, and he had a sign that said, I'm blind, please help me. And he had a little tin cup uh, nailed to or taped to the neck of his guitar for people to put donations in. And he said that that day we were kind of ornery young men, and it occurred to us to just to play a little prank on this guy. And he said, we, we decided that we would each take two or three nails out of our nail belt and we would just drop them 
into his cup. It made a loud ringing sound and he stopped playing the guitar and he looked up and he said, oh, thank you kindly. Thank you so much. You're, you're very kind. God bless you. And we kind of snickered, he said, as we went on to get our lunch. But he said, the next day, that started weighing on me. I was sort of sick to my stomach about what we had done to that poor man. And my teacher said, I, I went and did what only desperate people do. I went and talked to the pastor. You're supposed to laugh at that. <laughs> I went and talked to the pastor, walked into his study and, and told him everything that, that I had done. And he was busy. He glanced up from what he was doing. And he said, young man, do you realize that our country is in the midst of the biggest war in our history, that hundreds, thousands of people are dying every day, and you're worried about a couple of nails in a man's cup? And he said, I, I choked back my tears, and I apologized for taking his time, and I, I backed out of the room. But he said, you know, I still, I still was carrying that around he said so I, I went and I found the youth minister we didn't pay her she didn't have any training but she was a real minister and I went and talked to the youth minister and I told her what I had done and I could see from the look on her face that she was hurt that that she was troubled by what I had done and and she said oh you know, God, God forgives you for that, but here's what you need to do. You need to go and find that man as soon as you can, and you need to tell him what you did and, and tell him how sorry you are. And, and if you've got a, a quarter or a couple of dimes, put, put, him, put him in his cup. And he said, I went and did that. And the man smiled at me and said, oh, I know how it is. I forgive you. And he said he forgave me. And then I didn't have to carry that around anymore. He said, I, I know that it seems like such a little thing to some people, just a couple of nails in the cup. But he said, here's the thing. Why don't you think about the stuff that you're carrying around with you? And wouldn't you like to let it go? That's the story he told us one day. And the only thing I might want to add to that story is this. Think about all the stuff other people are carrying around with them. And wouldn't you like to help them let it go by offering them your forgiveness? So I'm going to give you a, a symbolic way to let that stuff go today. I'm going to invite you forward in a moment to put a nail into the cross. Don't drive them all the way in. we got to take them back out later. <laughs> Don't get too carried away. But as you strike the nail the first time or two, I want you to I want you to invite Jesus to pray that prayer for you. You don't have to have tears in your eyes or bean burrito in your hand. Just, just invite Jesus to pray his prayer for you. Father, forgive me because I just don't know what I'm doing. And then... As you, as you strike the nail another time or two, I want you to pray Jesus' prayer for somebody else, somebody that has hurt you, somebody you're struggling to forgive, and pray that prayer for them. Father, won't you forgive them? Because they don't know what they're doing any more than I do. I invite you to, to take a nail out of the cup and put it into the cross when you're ready.